today's topic, refining one's style and expression. And hopefully you have the online handout. And uh, there's the main handout, which I'm going to talk through. And this is kind of a summary of some uh, other handouts I have. I, um, got a number of uh, more detailed handouts on the website also, which you can look at on your own. I just put one up this afternoon. In fact, you might want to go back and check. <coughs> I put up one this afternoon about Konglish expressions. We'll talk about Konglish a bit today, which is a fun topic. First of all, we'll talk about verbs today. Then we'll talk about other things like nouns and uh, uh, um, colloquial expressions. Um, sometimes colloquial expressions creep into your writing. In case you don't know colloquial, that has to do with informal conversational language, colloquial language. Uh, and this is from Latin meaning with, like co, cooperate. And this is a Latin root meaning to speak or to say, like as in eloquent, uh, <coughs> uh, loquacious and such. So. Um, Koreans have a number of problems with English verbs, different types of English verbs, uh, which is not surprising because verbs are really different between English and Korean. They work rather differently. One area is modal verbs. Uh, frankly, I haven't really figured out the Korean modal verbs. Uh, and frankly, uh, for me, trying to learn Korean, there just aren't any really, really well-written uh, grammar sources out there. Um, the grammar sources are badly written, very traditional style, and often don't really have a good discussion of modal verbs. They maybe have the hal su da, but that's it. Uh, maybe the dui da, and that's, that's it. I know there are others, though, but I, it's hard to find you know, a good reference for all of them. But apparently, they work differently than in English, because I still am not sure about these Korean modal expressions. I know, like, hai he da, and, but I'm not really sure how they correlate to the English. Um, and likewise for you, you probably may have some uncertainties too. Partly because of the differences between the languages, um, and partly because sometimes English has not been taught very properly here. <coughs> for one thing, often your English classes in the past were very rule-based. The teacher will throw a bunch of rules at you and say, here, memorize these rules. That's not what grammar is. That's very sad if they've trained you to think of grammar that way. Grammar is actually really fun. It's not a bunch of rules, like mechanical rules. Grammar is really a system of patterns, and these are patterns that have meaning. Although the meanings are often abstract, you know, things like articles. Uh, we talked about articles before, definite articles and definite articles. The perfect tense, those are kind of abstract meaning patterns. Uh, modal verbs, likewise, they're kind of abstract. They have, they say something about your attitude about what you're talking about when you say could, can. You're saying it's something about your evaluation of the event or the situation, and that's a bit abstract. It's something about the speaker's perspective of the action, and uh, I guess in English we do it differently than in Korean. Um, plus, you, if you had traditional teachers, they taught you some rules about rules that may not be correct. <coughs> so. When you look at could, like here, we could perform the experiment. What does that mean? What tense? This, without an, a context, what's the main tense, uh, the main default meaning of this? Is the writer talking about something in the future or the past? We could perform the experiment. How would a native English speaker understand that But the default interpretation, the mo most common interpretation? This is something kind of future, hypothetical, something in the present, something in the past. <coughs> uh, you all seem puzzled, don't you? I'm going to call on somebody. What's the time frame here? We could perform the experiment. Okay. A lot of Koreans will think that the main interpretation is past, and I think you were taught that way. Um, that's not exactly true. The main meaning of could is primarily kind of a future or conditional or hypothetical. 
we could perform the experiment if we could get funding. You know, if I can get funding from the U.S. National Institutes of Health, then we could do this experiment if we had the funding for it. Um, now, historically, the verb could did evolve as a past tense of can in the history of English. Uh, but in modern English, the, it, and it can sometimes have a past interpretation in certain contexts. But the main interpretation is a hypothetical or conditional. Like we could do this maybe in the future if we had some funding. Okay. If I can get a grant from the government, then you know, we could do this experiment. But if we don't get the grant, then, well, there's no way. So if you want the past meaning to be clear, if you really want to express a past tense meaning, then what's a better way to say it? You could use be able to. Yeah, so you could say we were able to perform the experiment if you want to emphasize ability. Uh, that's the best option if you want to emphasize ability in the past. You could also say we successfully performed the experiment with an adverb. Um, or if just the emphasis is on uh, the achievement, the performing, you could simply say we performed the experiment. Um, but we were able to perform the experiment would be a much more clear than could, because could could be ambiguous. Uh, without a context, peop an English speaker, an English native English speaker is going to think that's hypothetical, you know, future, or hypothetical, or conditional. Uh, and, th and that's often because uh, Koreans have been taught improperly um, very traditional rules that are not necessarily true. Now, could can be passed in certain contexts. For example, a time phrase, like when I was young, I could lift 20 kilograms. You know, in a time phrase like that. Uh, or certain uh, negative expressions, like we couldn't do it. Uh, so, with a negative, with a time phrase, a time context in the past, then it's more clearly a past reference. The next one that Koreans have trouble with, um, probably a lot of East Asians, um, could, may, might. Uh, must is probably clear. He must be lying. If you say he must be lying, what does that mean? It's certain that he's... Yeah, it's kind of certain that he's lying. This must be the right explanation for what he's doing. He must be lying. But what's hard for Koreans is could, may, might. What's the difference? He could be lying, he may be lying, he might be lying. This is, this is a little nuance. Uh, it may not always make a difference in terms of correctness, but sometimes it makes a difference in the nuance. <coughs> so, if we take a an example like Bill Clinton, when Bill Clinton famously lied, denied having an affair with Monica Lewinsky, and people, some people said he must be lying, he could be lying, he may be lying, he might be lying. Uh, psychologists who know about facial expressions and body language, they could tell when he appeared on TV and he said, I did not do anything with that woman. Uh, they could tell. Uh, uh, maybe the average person couldn't see it, but he for a psychologist who knows body language and facial expressions, it was obvious he was lying. So they would say, he must be lying, because his body language gives it away. Now for other people, you know, depending on your view of Bill Clinton, you might say he, he could be lying, or he must be lying. He, I'm sorry, he could be lying, he may be lying, he might be lying. What's the difference? Any ideas about the difference between uh, uh, could, uh, may and might, a little tricky. So, well, could comes from can, and can uh, has to do with a person's internal ability. So, in this case, it's more of a nuance. It's, uh, if you're looking at Bill Clinton, the man, and your beliefs about Bill Clinton, um, and if you, th if you just, if you don't trust him, and you realize, you remember, and it's really strong in your memory, well, he lied before, he had a few scandals before he became president, so maybe you don't think he's really an honest person. So you might look at his internal ability or nature. It's within his nature, so he could be lying. <coughs> uh, 
because um, you're suspicious, you're not sure, but you say he could be lying. So can and could kind of focus on internal qualities of the person or the thing. Uh, may and might, uh, may is maybe a little bit more certain than might. Might is a little more uncertain or uh, may is a bit more probable. But may and might kind of focus on the ex you, what you think of the external situation, the external circumstances. So if you look at this situation, here we have a woman who's accusing the president of an affair. And here we have a president who's angrily denying it on TV. And then he says some really strange things when he's interviewed by the investigator. And he says really strange things like, were you alone with Monica Lewinsky? And he says, well, it depends on how you define alone. And he actually said that. <laughs> uh, when you look at the circumstances, politician, he's being accused. Well, politicians are like that. When you look at the circumstances, you might think, oh, he may be lying. He might be lying. If you're a little more. Uh, think it's more probable you say he may be lying. So may and might tend to focus more on the external. Can and could focus more on the internal. Uh, can and could have more to do with uh, ability uh, or the nature of or character of something or someone. May and might tend to focus more on the external circumstances. When you look at the circumstances, uh, it seems probable or likely or possible that you know, he's lying. <coughs> so that's a slight difference in nuance. Um, <coughs> uh, also, Koreans may have trouble with uh, should and must. Uh, so must can express obligation. So um, if you're working for a bank and you're evaluating your bank's online banking system and you tell your boss, our online banking system uh, must be easier to use. Well, that, does that sound natural? Our banking system must be easier to use. It sounds a little funny um, because must in this uh, would be like obligation. Uh, it should be obligation. Or it could be appearance, like he must be lying, very, very certain from appearance. You infer he must be lying. That's a very certain. So must can be either a very certain, certain inference. You infer he must be lying. Uh, or it's obligation, like you must. Uh, not uh, put your gum uh, under the desk or something like that, which American school kids do, by the way. If you know that, American school kids, they, need, they get in trouble. Uh, the teacher doesn't want them to chew gum, so they'll stick it under the desk and avoid getting caught. So American school desk, kids' desks have a lot of dried gum under them. In case your kids ever go to America, they might. Yeah. But uh, back to the online banking example, it would be better to say should. should um, conveys what kind of sense. Our online banking system should be easier to use. What is the meaning there of should? In that case, you're telling your boss, you know, there's something wrong with our online banking system. It's really clunky. It only works for Internet Explorer, and it's Explorer is a really terrible browser. It needs to work for Firefox and Chrome. Uh, it's a problem I find here in Korea. Uh, so our online banking system should be easier to use. That's expressing, expressing kind of like strong advice, recommendation, suggestion when you say should. Uh, either in the present, like our online banking system should be easier to use. It should, it needs to work with Firefox and Chrome and other browsers, Safari. Um, or in the past, like, I should not have eaten so much food, now I feel sick. Uh, you know, past, uh, suggesting something about the past. You should not have eaten all that food, now you're fat. <clears throat> uh, so modals are tricky. And I, I don't really know how to say should in Korean, actually. How do you say should? There is only one way to say should. Uh -huh. So this is why Koreans have trouble with must and should. They're both expressed by haya hada, uh, hada uh, in Korean. But in English, there's a distinction. Just like in English, there's this really abstract distinction between may, might, could. And so in English, there's this distinction here, which are expressed 
by one verb in Korean, one verb form. Interesting. <coughs> okay. Uh, if any of you are in uh, English education or linguistics, at the end of this handout, I've got some references, some simple linguistic references. Uh, for a lot of ESL writers, not just Koreans, a lot of ESL writers um, don't really have a very um, big vocabulary of verbs for academic writing. And so a lot of writers will use a lot of very common verbs, what we call light verbs. These are really common verbs like do and give and make. <clears throat> I think it's helpful to know light verbs because when you're giving a presentation or a lecture, um, this is these are helpful. If you can't think of the right verb, you can throw in you can use a light verb instead. Um, they're pretty easy verbs. But in academic writing, you want to use more precise verbs because you want to sound more precise, more formal, <coughs> more intelligent. Uh, and at the bottom, there is a website called thesaurus.com. Thesaurus is a dictionary of synonyms. And the best dictionary is, the best thesaurus out there <coughs> is the online thesaurus.com. Thesaurus.com is nice because it's also linked directly to dictionary.com. <coughs> dictionary.com is probably the best dictionary online uh, out there. So if you're not sure of what verb to use, um, you can go to thesaurus.com, which now there's one limitation. If it gives you a bunch of synonyms and you really aren't sure about how those synonyms are used, then that could be a problem and maybe you need to do some further looking up to see how those words are used in context properly. We'll talk more about that later. Um, so for example, do really has hundreds and hundreds or thousands of more specific words that you could use instead many times um, for an academic uh, paper. Um, and likewise, give and make. And there are some others. I think I've got a separate handout on the website for light verbs. Um, you do have light verbs in Korean. They're a little different. You have like ida, ita, nada, like, you know, hua nada, and neda, deda, tida. And I think what, karida, I think, is a, maybe a light verb is extremely common, I think. Karida, like, kamgi karida, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, th I think that karida is used with a lot of expressions in Korean, is it? It may be a, what we would call a light verb. <clears throat> so, uh, for example, for verbs of making, uh, manufacturing make is kind of like the most basic uh, member of that category of verbs that, that have to do with making, and make, manufacture, create, produce, and such are more specific words. So the, a light verb is kind of like the most basic verb of this particular category of verbs. Uh, and this is not a complete list. There are some others I think I've got in a separate handout. Uh, do, give, make, be, take, set, uh, run, go, uh, maybe come. Those are uh, put, those are light verbs <coughs> in English. And so for academic writing, you want to use more specific verbs. Uh, likewise, phrasal verbs, uh, these are really confusing. Phrasal verbs are sort of compound verb. And in Korean, you have compound verbs where um, either the, the compound um, kind of adds something to the meaning of the verb in terms of maybe the kind of motion or direction. So for example, tora kara, tora oda, which has to do with the direction of your motion um, relative to the speaker. And also some of them are kind of metaphorical. So buddy da, to throw away. And you combine it with what forget, so to forget is what? Ija Borida, which is so Borida adds something metaphorical to the meaning of like completely or totally, completely or totally forget. So Jukta, and I read this in a linguistics paper, Juga Borida, which I guess is like to really die, not just die, but he really died. Uh, I guess in English you might have to use an idiom like he kicked the bucket or. <clears throat> something like that to say he really died. Uh, so it kind of intensifies the meaning. And so phrasal verbs in English are kind of like that. Uh, sometimes it's something uh, uh, about the degree of the action uh, or the direction like to stand up. But oftentimes it's metaphorical. These, these words like up and over and out are kind of metaphorical. That's something metaphorical to the meaning. So for example, you take over 
which is this kind of motion, uh, the physical motion. Uh, and so a lot of these words like over and out and around and such, the literal meaning is spatial, having to do with space, location. Um, sometimes they get extended to time, so time expressions, that's kind of a, a metaphorical extension. So you say it's over, class is over, and meaning it's you know, finished. So a lot of these prepositions get extended to time expressions. Uh, and, and then you extend them further metaphorically in, especially in phrasal verbs. Uh, and so for the over movement, you might kind of, uh, for different metaphorical meanings, focus on different aspects. So you can kind of look at it here where you're, uh, <clears throat> the whole motion of over is maybe like that, but you kind of focus on here where you're above something and you might use metaphorical expressions like I'm, uh, uh, I preside over a company of 500 employees. So that being over 500 employees kind of comes metaphorically from this, the sense of like authority or control or managing or supervising. <clears throat> or uh, from here, it's over. Or you say to your ex-boyfriend, I'm over you. I don't have any interest in you anymore. It's finished. I'm over you. Uh, so, and then it's completion. Or, so there's the idea of completion and there are other meanings. Uh, I'll have to put up, a, I've got a handout I'll, about over and up. I'll put up on the website later uh, now that I remember that. <clears throat> so phrasal verbs are often very metaphorical, but a lot of them tend to be more colloquial or informal. So phrasal verbs, um, by the way, in the, um, the uh, references at the end, there are a couple of good references on phrasal verbs I highly recommend. The Oxford Dictionary of Phrasal Verbs at the back, and kind of the appendix, it gives a breakdown of the different meanings of phrasal verbs, like the meanings of up in phrasal verbs, and the meaning of over in phrasal verbs. <coughs> and um, another book called Prepositions Explained kind of exp um, gives more explanations of the metaphorical meanings of prepositions or when they're used in uh, uh, phrasal verbs. <coughs> um, but um, many times phrasal verbs are more um, informal. This is kind of from the, you know, English came originally from, where did the English language come from? Do you know? I might have mentioned maybe the first day of this, the first lecture. Where did the English language come from? It was heavily influenced by Latin, but genetically, historically, it mainly came from Old German. Um, and then a lot of Latin came in later on. So it started around, you know, AD 400 when the Romans were leaving England the, because the Romans were being attacked by the Goths and the Vandals. And so they pulled their troops out of England in order to fight the Goths and the Vandals over in the uh, northeastern front. And so England is open. So the German, there were various tribes in what is now Germany and Denmark and uh, uh, Holland. And they took advantage of this vacuum and they went over and invaded England. Of course, Germans always like to invade England. Uh, <coughs> you know your history. Uh, so this, they brought various dialects of Old German over to England, which quickly became a separate language called Old English. Uh, <coughs> and um, later on, um, around the year 1066, what happened in 1066? The year 1066, a very important date in the history of England and the English language. Um, in northern France, there was a group of people called the Normans, led by William, William the Conqueror, uh, and they invaded England. And of course, France also uh, really likes to invade England. Um, so they invaded and took over England. <coughs> and at this time, this is a sort of old, a form of Old French, which is very similar to the Latin. And the two languages blended together over time. And so a lot of Latin, Old French words came into English. Um, then later on in history, we had the Renaissance, or Renaissance, revival of learning, new studies. Uh, people are, again, interested in studying ancient Latin and Greek language and culture. And they're also doing all kinds of new studies, the birth of science and technology. And they need to create names for a lot of new ideas and things. So they went to Latin and Greek to create new names. And so 
Uh, the Latin and English comes from those two influences. So the phrasal verbs are kind of something from the old German part of our language. And if, have any of you studied German or, or Dutch? If you study German or Dutch, German has something that's kind of like phrasal verbs. It's very common in German. It's kind of similar. <coughs> so phrasal verbs are kind of the more uh, informal Germanic part of our language. Uh, but in academic writing, we use phrasal verbs probably much less often. Uh, a few times, but not as much. Instead, for more formal words, we will go to the words that came from Latin, the Latin-based words, sometimes the Greek. So academic English tends to be Latin, um, sometimes Greek. And so, for example, find out, that's a phrasal verb. But in academic writing, you probably want to use something more formal instead, like determine or ascertain, uh, discover, instead of find out. Uh, for go out, you know, go out has a lot of meanings, and depending on the context, you could you know, go to thesaurus.com and find uh, some other more specific verbs for your context, like exit or diminish, depart, uh, recede, or whatever. And many of these are from Latin. So when students ask me how they can improve their English, especially their vocabulary, I tell them, well, you should probably study Latin and Greek and French and German, <laughs> and that will really help your English. <clears throat> uh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, when possible, instead of a phrasal verb, try to find a more formal verb from your thesaurus, uh, maybe a single word, Latin verb, nice, pretty Latin verbs sound very nice and impressive. <clears throat> Another thing I've noticed Koreans have trouble with are, are reporting verbs. Like when you need to cite a source in your paper, you need to you know, um, frame it somehow. Like um, recent studies, you're referring to recent studies, and recent studies have mentioned, have found, have discovered, uh, have reported that, have emphasized that, have recommended that. Those are reporting verbs. Reporting, you're indirectly, indirectly reporting what someone else or some other study has said. Koreans have sometimes trouble with these things too. <coughs> mention, for example, <coughs> means to briefly, briefly mention something. Uh, it does not mean to discuss. Uh, so if you mean discuss, you can say discuss or describe. But mention is to very briefly refer to something. Um, and I find Koreans misusing mention, <clears throat> uh, recommend. Um, so recommend, you can say they rec um, the, um, there's some notes here about the grammar of recommend and other verbs like suggest and such. We recommended that they increase or that they should increase. Um, or recommend increasing, there's a footnote about that. Those kind of uh, you could say they rec we recommend uh, that such and such should be increased, or we recommend that such and such be increased. Um, there's a footnote about that that's kind of a, the more formal way is we recommend that such and such be increased, that X um, <coughs> um, <coughs> increase the number of days in school. Uh, that's kind of an older and more formal structure. Or you could say should. We recommend that X should be increased. Uh, support does not take a that clause. You can't say the finding supported that uh, X happened. Uh, you could say support the view or the claim that. <coughs> and that's a common mistake I see in uh, writing. Uh, I'm going to talk about all of those. I've got another handout online about reporting verbs. Two handouts, actually, on reporting verbs on the website, I think. So you can look at those. Um, just one more I'll say is blame and criticize. I think these must be the same in Korean, blame and criticize. What's the Korean verb for blame or criticize? Pinan. <coughs> hmm? mm -hmm. So I find Koreans often um, using blame when probably they should say criticize. Criticize is to kind of make a negative evaluation of something, like, you know, don't criticize me, stop criticizing me. So that's what you should say to your, uh, your boyfriends, your husbands, you know, stop criticizing me. Not blaming uh, is to assign blame for a certain mistake or fault, like uh, <clears throat> the engineers were blamed for not catching the technical error. 
Uh, so when you're scribing fault for a specific mistake uh, or wrongdoing, that's blame. Or criticizes more generally, uh, negatively evaluating or negatively saying um, something. <coughs> um, next, um, uh, a lot of, of verbs, you know, have an agent or a doer, uh, and then an object that's affected by it. But uh, particularly with verbs of emotion and feeling, uh, the subject, for example, may be the one that's experiencing an emotion or a state, uh, and the object is a stimulus or cause of that. And these seem to be confusing for Koreans, so I will hear not just Koreans, but Japanese and Chinese also. They will say something like, uh, uh, I'm boring. Like, okay, yeah, yeah, you are boring. I really can't <laughs> stand to be around you. You just put me to sleep. You know? If you're that kind of person, if you could say you're boring if you're the sort of person that puts other people to sleep. Uh, but if you're expressing your own mental state, you need to say, I'm bored. If you say, I'm exciting, it means you're a fun person to be with, not I'm excited. If you're talking about your own mental state, I'm excited, I'm bored, uh, and such. So Koreans get confused about that. Uh, I'm scary, okay, yes, <laughs> you are. <laughs> I'm interesting, okay. Well, maybe your therapist thinks you're interesting, I don't know. Uh, I'm interested, that's your own mental state. Um, something, whatever causes that, is interesting or uh, scary or exciting or boring. Uh, a professor can be boring. <clears throat> you feel bored when the professor is boring. Uh, so watch out for those in conversation uh, as well. In conversation, it could lead to some interesting misunderstandings. Uh, I've also noticed Koreans have trouble with uh, verbs that indicate um, state or change of state. And so I will. Uh, often in writing, especially, <coughs> Santa Claus was existed, <coughs> or the car was disappeared. <coughs> Can you say that? Because Koreans and Japanese often make this kind of mistake. Can you, was existed? Is that possible? No. What about the car was disappeared? So why do Koreans often make these mistakes? And Japanese. And Chinese. These are it's mainly with verbs of state <coughs> or change of state um, that Koreans and other Asian students uh, have trouble here. Uh, I think it's because the passive voice works differently in Korean. <coughs> so uh, the verb to let's take the verb to close, which in Korean was it? Uh, to close, which is um, this is what. Uh, Transitive, right? Tadongsa? Is that right? Yeah, so that's transitive. And then for the intransitive, tachi na, that's the intransitive. Or passive, it can be passive in meaning, right? So the door closed by itself, or the door was closed by somebody, is that correct? So this is kind of confusing. You've got Certain verbs express either passive or intransitive meaning. So the door was closed by somebody, or the door, door closed, that is, it closed by itself. And for the active meaning, like I closed the door, use a different verb. But, so you've kind of got two different meanings that for Koreans uh, are together, because in a sense they are, uh, in a sense something is happening to the door. So there's a certain logic behind the way Korean does this because something is happening to the door, you're focusing on the fact that something's happening to the door, or the door's something, some change is happening with the door. Uh, it's closing, either by itself or because someone else is doing it. <coughs> well, that's different from this. But in English, we have a different kind of uh, distinction. <coughs> um, and so, Korean writers will often make these mistakes with 
uh, for example, intransitive verbs, tatung sa, which should not be passive, like this uh, or this, when these are verbs of state or change of state. Um, and another problem is uh, certain verbs. Uh, in English can be either transitive or intransitive change could be transitive or intransitive it can be either you know tarung sa or tarung sa um, but with slightly different nuances if you say this attitude must be changed what's implied here? so if you say the door was closed you're implying there was somebody who was doing it somebody who is somehow relevant. You, just, you would normally just say the door was closed and you don't care who closed it. Uh, the door closed. I'm sorry, if you say the door closed, it closed by itself or you don't care who closed it, it's not important. If you say the door was closed, that implies there's somebody doing it. The door was closed by the thief <coughs> or the house owner. So when you say this attitude must be changed, when you say when you use the passive voice, you are implying that there is a doer, an agent, that's somehow important here. This attitude must be changed by what? By mind control forces? You need to, and, and where I saw this in the paper, this person was, this writer was talking about gender attitudes in society. So if you say this um, attitude about women's roles must be changed, by whom? By God? By mind control? It kind of sounds weird. Uh, so in that case, uh, you need to you you want the attitude to change by itself. You're not you don't want to imply that there's some kind of magical force that's changing people's attitudes. You're saying this attitude needs to change, uh, and so this is tricky for verbs like change and increase and decrease, which can be either transitive or intransitive. Uh, and if you use the passive, then it has a really different meaning, and it may not be a meaning that you want when the active simply <clears throat> says something about the subject changing and maybe you don't care uh, who or what changes it, you just, uh, the subject changes or needs to change. So I think uh, <clears throat> someday I'll have a separate handout about that or if you go to my, to my other websites, I think on my writing website, I think I might have a handout about that. But uh, if you're interested more. Uh, so for example on page four another example the monitor was suddenly changed and yeah, that sounds weird like some magical force change your monitor. The monitor suddenly changed or was changed into so kind of a like an into phrase or a, what, a result phrase uh, into a screen of illegal operation messages if you're using Windows uh, uh, or was changed into a screen full of illegal operation messages by the evil operating system. So when you're blaming the operating system like Windows for something. <coughs> uh, so those are verbs. So, so those are some of the main problems with the verbs. A few other things, uh, nouns and pronouns. Um, I think I've got a separate handout that talks about some of these other word choice issues um, briefly mentioned. Um, there's confusion about part. Um, and I think you've borrowed the word part into Korean from English. Uh, but in academic English, we often want to use something more specific like section or sector or um, division. Uh, so when I teach essay writing, and I'm talking about the body sections of an essay, like the body paragraphs, my students will often use the phrase body parts. But if you say body parts, that sounds like CSI, right? like <laughs> someone's liver or someone's hand. Okay, we found body parts. Uh, so it's body sections of an essay, you know, this sector of society. Sounds better in academic or formal expression. Uh, thesis, dissertation, article, these are often, I think, uh, the same word in Korean. Uh, thesis is kind of like a major research writing project that you do. Uh, maybe for a bachelor's degree, most often for a master's or a thesis, it, uh, a PhD. In the North American system, if it's for a PhD, that kind of thesis we often call dissertation. So dissertation refers to what you write for your PhD degree. 
although in England it's a kind of reversed. Um, they say dissertation and thesis. <clears throat> and then article is like, you know, a published research article in an academic journal, uh, the kinds of things you read in your graduate classes. And an article from journal of the journal nature or the journal of linguistics or something like that. Um, next, there are certain nouns that are mainly non-count nouns. So for example, equipment, you don't really say equipments, you can say a piece of equipment, but this word in English is a non-count noun. It's kind of a mass or quantity noun. Faculty, um, in North American, okay, so faculty meaning professors, it's kind of a collective noun. So you wouldn't say a faculty, you could say a faculty member or a professor. Um, now in Europe, faculty means department, like um, the college uh, faculty of Western history. So in European, uh, um, continental, continental Europe, and I think even in England, faculty can mean department, like the faculty of history, the faculty of political science. Uh, when you're talking about people, faculty is a collective noun, not uh, a faculty, but um, uh, you'd say a faculty member or professor. Furniture, you talk about furniture. Homework is usually a collective. You don't usually say homework, although sometimes we do. Um, research, doing research, not researches, um, staff. Vocabulary. Um, vocabulary is usually just singular, um, like all the words of the language or all of the words that you know. Uh, if you're talking about a particular word, then you should say word. So you don't usually say vocabularies. That's not, you, that's not common. Unless maybe in the linguistics context, for example, you're talking about you know, maybe a person knows several different languages, several different languages and that person has different vocabularies in, in her head. She has you know, like Spanish vocabulary and English vocabulary system in her head, you know, or diff vo different vocabularies of different languages or different styles. But otherwise, vocabulary is usually singular. For the plural, you would say words or, or vocabulary items. <coughs> um, uh, let's see. Some others. Uh, in speaking, it's convenient to say things like someone, something, somewhere. But in academic English, you probably want more specific words. Um, the next thing, section three, has to do with collocations. So uh, the location that's related to this Latin, to speak or say, uh, a different word form. So Latin had irregular verbs where the, the stems change, like teach, taught. In English, teach, taught, the, the CH disappears. Um, the taught actually is spelled with a GH. And that's because, do you know why? We have a silent GH in English. Because a thousand years ago, it was pronounced. It was a H, tacht, a H, like in German. But British got tired of saying H because they got lazy a thousand years ago, and it disappeared from spoken English, but it's still there as a fossil in the written language. But, so teach, taught, is a sound, sound change. Well, Latin verbs had a similar pattern. So there's a Q in colloquial, but a C in collocation. It's the same verb meaning to speak or to say. <coughs> um, so um, often there are certain words that go together. That's a collocation. Uh, so we say inflict a wound. We don't really say do a wound or make a wound. We inflict a wound. We withdraw an offer. Um, certain patterns are just really more common together. A crushing defeat. Um, nouns and verbs, be buzzes. Um, possessive or groups like a flock of sheep. And you can find more of these online. <coughs> um, the uh, perhaps a more tricky one is when you have a verb or a noun that then takes an adjective to complete its meaning. And I've got a separate handout online. I think I posted it recently on the website. <coughs> so there's really a, a bunch of these. So for example, influence. Uh, if it's a verb, it takes a direct object like uh, the um, uh, the history of China has influenced its modern foreign policy, where influence takes a direct object. But then when you use influence as a noun, then it takes um, what preposition to complete its meaning? On. So um, the influence of x on y. And I mentioned prepositions are, often, are sometimes metaphorical. And this is true in many of these expressions in English. Influence on something. So. Uh, uh, 
Ch China's past has had an influence on its current foreign policy. So why on? Well, the reason why prepositions are often hard to learn in another language, any, anytime you go from one language to another, the prepositions are different, they're hard, because often these meanings are metaphorical, or uses are often metaphorical, so influence on. It's kind of like, um, this is like foreign policy, and it's kind of like he, this kind of a metaphorical uh, idea, uh, a physical metaphor of something having an influence on something else. It's a metaphor. And so prepositions are used very metaphorically in English or in other languages. <clears throat> and so that's the problem with collocations when you use prepositions with verbs and nouns. <coughs> um, so there's some examples here, and I've got a separate handout on the website on some common collocation errors that I've noticed. Um, there's some um, other terminology, um, Konglish expressions. I've got a separate handout on Konglish expressions. Um, those are interesting. Oftentimes, Korean borrows English words and gives them a different meaning, meanings that are um, kind of strange to English speakers. So if you say fighting like that, <laughs> if, a, if English speakers hear you who do not know Korean, they're going to think, what? Who's fighting? Where? I'd like to see a fight. You know. <clears throat> so that's completely a completely different meaning, fighting. Um, this is not, in English, not a Y shirt. This is a dress shirt. This is a dress shirt. Uh, what you're wearing there, that is a t-shirt. No, there's no collar. That's a t-shirt. Um, and has anybody got a, one of those shirts with a collar and a horsey? Well, of course, that's a, I don't see anyone wearing a horse shirt. It's got a, a collar and maybe a few buttons here. That's a polo shirt. Um, my favorite one is panty. In English, men do not wear panties unless you're maybe, <coughs> you know. So guys don't ask for panties in the department store. You'll get, you'll get the wrong thing or some very strange looks. Panties are only for women in English. <clears throat> um, things like that. I, I don't know in Korean why this is called a consent. I would like for someone to explain that to me. Consent is like you give permission to somebody. Not one of those things. <laughs> Unless you work in construction and you say, if you're building a house and you can say, give me a consent. Uh, no. That's a plug-in or an outlet. Uh, an electrical outlet. MT it doesn't really exist in English. MT, membership training, that's pure Konglish. Uh, after service, what else? Um, uh, there was another one I was thinking of. Cunning, that's not really cheating in English. Cunning is like craftiness, sneakiness. The fox is cunning. Foxes are cunning. Arbeite is actually not from English. That's via Japanese from German. Uh, and in German, Arbeit simply means work in the regular sense. <clears throat> uh, in Korean, Arbeit means temporary or part-time work. In German, Arbeit is just work, like your full-time work. In German, by the way, uh, in the German language for temporary or part-time work, they use the English, Jobben, ich, yeah, or Job. How many say Job? That kind of means like part-time or temporary work. So Arbeit is more like full-time work in German. Uh, there are a lot of other interesting Konglish expressions I've got on the website. <coughs> um, hopefully you're aware of gender bias, um, especially for academic writing, business writing, professional writing. You wouldn't use girl to talk about a, an adult female. That would be considered kind of sexist. <coughs> uh, you would certainly never use boy for an, an adult. <laughs> it's strange. <coughs> uh, and it's always better to avoid saying his when you might be referring to women or a mixed group. Um, there are ways instead of using his or him or he, you can say like he or she, or you can change it to plural and say they. Um, instead of saying, you know, policeman, if it's a neutral context, context you can say police officer and, and so on. Uh, finally, there's some, there's some colloquial expressions, and uh, some of these you may not know are informal or colloquial. Besides, it's more informal. Instead, you can say, 
in addition or for the more bad, big, huge, good. Those are kind of vague colloquial expressions, kind of sort of lots of or a lot of. That's actually colloquial. It's better to say much or many in such stuff thing way, etc. Uh, you can look at those on your own. <coughs> uh, instead of saying thing, it's better to use a more specific, in that specific noun instead of thing in academic writing. Although for speaking, it's fine. Uh, contractions, we don't really use contractions as much in uh, formal English, like can't and don't. Um, also, fillers. If you are, so I use, I see Koreans overusing etc. in writing. Um, so if you've got blah, 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 especially if you have, for example, x, y, and z, you know, that's enough. Don't put etc. here, because that's kind of redundant, especially if you already have, for example. So avoid overusing etc. Uh, when you have lists of items, especially when you have something like this or, for example, it's kind of redundant. Uh, flow of clauses and sentences, so this has to do with, uh, well, this really has to do with more cohesion. I should put this with cohesion. Um, sometimes Koreans are confused about commas, colons, and semicolons. Um, so, for example, here on number one, on num uh, section five, lobsters are cannibalistic. This is one reason they are hard to raise in captivity. Um, this is what we call a comma splice, meaning you've improperly spliced or combined two sentences with a comma, but a comma is not enough. These are two main clauses, and they also need a, they either need a conjunction, like lobsters are cannibalistic, and this is one reason, or so this is uh, one reason, <coughs> or a semicolon, where a semicolon connects <coughs> two main clauses together. Uh, or number two, normal people need eight hours of sleep, but graduate students need only four, right? Okay, wait till you do qualifying exams, you won't get any sleep. You've done qual you have qualifying exams in your departments? Or preliminary exams before your dissertation? That was fun, I lost sleep for a week on those things. Um, colons and semicolons. Um, so a semicolon is kind of for connecting two main clauses uh, and indicating a logical relationship between them. So the tissue is cut into 0.1 millimeter strips, semicolon, blah, 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 and the strips are... So it's kind of here they're putting them together and implying some kind of logical relationship. In this case, a sequence of events, closely related events. So it kind of says these two things are closely related, like in this case, a sequence. So it's for joining two main clauses. Number two, there's something graduate students simply cannot live without, colon, coffee. So the colon is kind of more for anticipation. If you're sp speaking it, you might, your intonation might go up a little bit, like with a comma. Uh, there's something that graduate students simply cannot live without, colon, coffee. So this is kind of a, something that's um, expected or anticipated after a pause. Um, uh, or number three, before a list of items. Number four for definition, traffic light, a device that turns red as you approach it, uh, and such. <coughs> um, 5.1, some other notes on punctuation. After so, do you have a comma? Or after then in number two? Do you need commas after so or then at the beginning of a sentence? No, uh, not usually. Um, if you do that, that's kind of colloquial in academic writing, especially no comma after so or then. But I think Koreans often put commas there where they don't belong, maybe because of the intonation in Korean when you say what could or not or whatever. But in English, no comma usually. Uh, but with however, number three, do you need a comma? You definitely need a comma when, uh, for example, after however, uh, after furthermore, uh, in addition, additionally, uh, moreover, words like that. And I think I've got a separate handout about transitional words and punctuation somewhere. So, however, number four, um, if you've got however, 
in the middle of a sentence that's connecting two clauses, then it should be like this. And the same is true for furthermore and moreover. It should be blah, 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 semicolon, and then however, and then a comma. Uh, and five, therefore, should be separated with a comma. Therefore, comma. You can put thus or therefore at the beginning of a sentence, uh, especially therefore, takes a comma. Uh, also for uh, IE and EG, oh, I'm out of space here, blah, 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 comma, IE, comma, blah, 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 or blah, 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 comma, EG, comma, blah, blah, blah. So these should be separated by commas. Uh, by the way, these are from Latin, uh, IE, it est, meaning that is, EG, uh, for example, or in Latin, uh, Exemplum gratia. <clears throat> um, I've got some other handouts on the website, or I will if I don't have them. I'll check and make sure that there are some more that deal with all these uh, various issues. Now, uh, a lot of these things like collocations and word choice and how to use the right word in the right context, it's really hard because the word usage and meaning between the two languages are so different. Um, you're, I mean, Korean is completely unrelated to any Western language, and you've got words that are from Korean and Chinese, and in English you've got words from Old German and Latin and Greek, and really different meanings. So, how do you learn English vocabulary? Because this is a challenge for you uh, as academics in fields where you have to use English and have to write in English. Maybe you have to lecture in English someday or do conference presentations. So how do you build your English vocabulary? What's the right way? Read, read, a lot. Hmm? read a lot. Read a lot, yes. You must study education or linguistics. Okay, that's the right answer. Because a lot of Koreans will try to memorize vocabulary from vocabulary books. Does that help? No, that's not how the human brain works. Now, if, you're, if you have a computer, um, if you're a cyborg, that might help, that might work. Yeah, if you're a, a robot, you can learn that way. But if you're a human, that doesn't work. It's not the way the brain works. Um, one problem is you, you probably forget most of it. Secondly, there's no context to help you really remember it or to understand how the word is used. Um, so uh, what you need to do is a lot of, um, well, maybe some intensive reading and uh, a lot of extensive reading. And this is something that takes years and years uh, of, of work to do. Because one problem you have in a second language is your brain is not used to it. Your brain has to work a lot harder to process a second language. Whether you're reading or speaking, listening to me, uh, listening to a lecture, your brain is not really used to it. Your brain does your first language, which I think for all of you is Korean, because your brain has been doing Korean since you're babies. So your brain has can automatically process Korean instantly. Uh, you don't have to, to work on it. You don't have to think usually to recognize words, the word meanings, the grammar. It's just fully automatic. If you look at a Korean page, you can't help but to read and understand it. In a second language, your brain has to work harder. It's not automatic. You have to use a lot of your working memory. Um, it takes more work. Your understanding is not as good. You often have to go back and reread things. And you get tired, probably after reading in English, listening to lectures in English. It's tiring because you have to work more. Your brain has to use more of your working memory actively to do what is automatic in your first language. There's no easy way around this. It takes thousands and thousands of hours of practice and work to get your brain more, uh, more comfortable, more used to uh, English, to become a little more automatic in processing English. Um, thousands of hours. Uh, memorizing vocabulary books won't help. Taking Hogwarts classes won't necessarily help. The best way is if you expose yourself to English naturally. Uh, one, by reading. Two, maybe by exposing yourself to media materials like videos and music that you happen to like. Third, maybe by thinking to yourself in English. Um, um, that's helpful in learning a language, make yourself think in the language. It has to be materials that you like, that you enjoy, or that are informative or relative, relevant to you. 
maybe materials in your field of study as well as materials in other fields, or maybe stuff for uh, things like news also, materials for information as well as for entertainment and leisure. Uh, you want to expose yourself to a wide range of materials that are interesting because one is more natural input, two it's going to be more motivating. When you try to memorize words from vocabulary books and go to Hagwon classes, it's demotivating, the materials are boring, you can't really have the right motivation. This is a big problem with the education system here, the English education system. Um, there's so much pressure, and so kids grow up learning to view English as an obligation or as a pressure, like I have to learn English. It's actually self-defeating. You can't really, your brain doesn't work efficiently when it's doing something under pressure, when you do English because it's an obligation, because you have to. Um, either you learn to enjoy English by reading and listening to stuff that is interesting or informative or fun, or at least you learn to view English as simply a useful tool, that you don't mind using English because you realize it's useful to what you're doing and you don't resent it, you don't feel it as a pressure or an obligation. And, and that's the best way to learn English, is to one, make sure you have the right goals and motivations. Uh, not out of pressure or obligation, but because you either enjoy it or at least you just view it neutrally as a useful tool for your studies and your future, such that you don't mind learning English because you just see it as useful. Uh, <clears throat> and so from that you can learn, write proper strategies, uh, intensive and extensive reading. Intensive reading is probably what you do in your studies. You read a, maybe a text very carefully and you probably learn this in your Hagwon classes, but you don't have to take Hagwon classes. You can do this on your own. You just uh, you know, take a passage and you read it once through for the main idea. Then you go through again and try to guess the meanings of words from context. And then after that, you look up words that you can't guess, like keywords. Then you read through once or twice more to, for a full understanding of the text. So you do intensive reading sometimes. <clears throat> and then especially extensive reading, just reading a lot of stuff from, like I said, different styles, different genres, different kinds of materials from your field, from other fields, uh, academic, from academic to entertainment, uh, leisure, novels, whatever you like. Um, it's important to learn, that's the best way to learn vocabulary, to also make your brain more comfortable and efficient with English. Uh, because in order to learn vocabulary, you need to encounter it in context, um, you need to encounter each word at least several times in a natural context. Uh, one, to uh, understand how it's used, um, not just its meaning, but how it's used in context. And two, a context or context that can help you remember it. If you just memorize it from a book, you probably won't remember it. There's no cue or no context to help you remember it. You can do the same thing with listening. Um, you probably don't have as much time for listening as reading, but you can listen to you know, songs and videos that you like, whatever uh, academic lectures on YouTube or entertainment videos on YouTube or your favorite English songs. Sometimes you can listen intensively, kind of concentrating, trying to understand the meaning, maybe also practicing along, following along the video, what we call shadowing in uh, language instruction, uh, repeating after uh, the speaker, or singing after the song, your favorite song, or whatever. Uh, you can't do too much intensive uh, listening or too much intensive reading if it, because it might be tiring or boring after a while, but just enough so that it's not boring. But and extensive listening also, just listen, expose yourself to a lot of different meaning materials. Um, so especially extensive reading and, and extensive listening uh, over time. This needs to be over time because it takes thousands and thousands of hours of input and exposure and experience um, to develop your English skills in a, or your second language skills. <coughs> um, so uh, you don't have to take Hagwon classes to improve your English. You can do it on your own because uh, there's really an excessive reliance on the Hagwon system. And when you have kids, don't send your kids to Hagwons. You can actually teach your kids English. Uh, my wife is Korean and she learned English partly because her parents, who don't really speak English, they still taught her English, uh, at least English reading. Uh, 
and then she married an American uh, and helped her English too a bit. Uh, um, but even if your English is not perfect, you can teach your kids uh, and spend quality, quality time with your kids instead of shipping them off to the hog one until late at night. But they'll have a much happier childhood that way if you teach them English rather than uh, forcing them into the hog one, uh, the prison of hog ones. Okay, um, there are more handouts on the website, and I'll put a few more up later on. Do you have any questions? Okay, see you next week for uh, writing materials, writing for the teaching career.